we looked at all the college students that are, are gambling and smoking pot and, and drinking. Uh, when I was in college, uh, my freshman year, uh, some of the people were there just to have a good time, which was, seemed a little odd since it was an all-male college. Well, a lot of the colleges back in 1967 were all male. Notre Dame was all male. All the, the academies were all male. Princeton, Yale, Harvard, they were all male. Institutions, Marquette was all male. Yeah, Marquette was all male. Anyway, lots of all male institutions around the United States. Uh, so we started college, I started college. Um, not a very, I wasn't a very good student. I, high school was really easy for me. Uh, so when I got into college, I didn't know how to study, uh, but I, I struggled and I got through it. Um, but uh, there were some guys there that uh, had partied all the way through high school, and those guys decided that they would party all the rest of the way through college. And of course, they flunked out their first semester. They gambled and they did all kinds of stupid stuff, and they were gone. They were gone in one semester. <clears throat> So this is the, these are the people that we're talking about, the heavy drinkers, the heavy marijuana users. Of course, marijuana, in 1967, there wasn't that much marijuana around. There's hardly any, as a matter of fact, not in the middle of the country anyway. Uh, maybe there was marijuana here, maybe there was in California and, and Texas along the Mexican uh, border, but uh, there wasn't hardly any in the middle of the country. Uh, of course, they averaged lower grades and they had a lot more absences. Uh, these guys would play poker all night long, and then they wouldn't go to class the next day because they were so tired. But what was more important? Well, partying, of course. Don't be silly. Do you think classes are important? I'm wondering what you're all doing here. You should all be out. I don't know. Laying in a ditch someplace, drunk. Uh, different types of gamblers, uh, recreational social gamblers, are able to separate gambling from the rest of their lives. Uh, these are just like social drinkers. Uh, they can go and get drunk, uh, but they don't have to do it next weekend, and they don't have to do it until, you know, 4th of July. Uh, those are the, uh, the recreational social gamblers are just like rec recreational social drinkers. Uh, poor, uh, for professional gamblers, uh, their main source of income is gambling, and because of this, they are able to and willing to take losses in their business. Uh, the guy that shot up Las Vegas, was a professional gambler. Uh, he has done nothing his entire life except gamble. Uh, seems a little odd. If I won money, if, if somebody just gave me $100,000, well, would you feel like you, it was yours? If you didn't do anything for it, would you just take it? I just took 60 bucks. And then give the rest of it away? I just got 80 bucks. <laughs> You're going to do something for that 80 bucks. <laughs> would, you, would you take it? What would you do with it? You got $100,000 all of a sudden. What are you going to do with it? Go to Las Vegas. Have a good time. I'm just trying to go travel. Travel somewhere. Okay. Would you feel like it was yours? How much was it? $100,000. Is that not enough? $200,000. <laughs> <laughs> Would you feel like it was yours? If I want it, from Kevin? Oh, whatever. Somebody gave you $100,000? Took it out of my 401k? No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> the 401k, you earned that money. What are you going to do with that $100,000? Somebody just gave you $100,000. Uh, I invested it, I guess. Oh, jeez. Feel like it was yours? Well, it depends on where it's coming from. That's what I'm asking. Ah. That's the question. I don't care. Uh, you, you won it in the lottery, $100,000 in the lottery. Sure, Would you feel it. like it was yours? Yeah, I think it was a lottery ticket. <laughs> then, then you invested in winning. <laughs> then $2, two, two dollars of that is yours because $2 is Did you hear about the 24-year-old who won $700 million? Isn't that the third highest? I don't know, but the fact that he's 20, 24, though. But he's only getting three something. Oh. That's hard to chunk it. <laughs> would, you, would you feel like it was yours? Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering. It's like pay for grad school. You go in that short. Would you feel like it? $200,000. We're up to $200,000. Would, would you feel like it was yours? Except for the $2. 
you earned that two dollars. But that one hundred and eighty nine thousand nine hundred and eighty ninety dollars. You just it's not what you do for it. You bought it, take it. Come on in. You guys can come in. Come on in. Would you, would you feel like it was yours? Yes. Okay. I was just wondering. <laughs> If somebody gives you money, is is it your money? All the money in my pocket, which is, there's not that much anymore, but all the money in my pocket is I, I earned by you know talking to you guys, which is doesn't feel like I earned it anyway, because I talk to people all the time and nobody pays me for it. Okay, so that's a professional gambler, and that's all they do. Um, the gambler that shot up Las Vegas and then shot himself. Uh, was making over a million dollars a year gambling, and I guess you could do that, uh, but I don't know. It's like, what's your job? What good have you done? The the human race. Antisocial gambler's may steal gamble, uh, st steal to gamble, and have no conscience about the thievery and corruption that they represent. And those are antisocial gamblers. There are two subtypes of pathological or problem gamblers. Uh, Action-seeking gamblers are frenetic, excited, and are always seeking to escape. That's the reason that they are gamblers. Escape-seeking gamblers are drawn to gambling machines and are often responsible people with good jobs. Uh, but they begin gambling to escape from their emotions or just to escape boredom. And of course, that's the biggest problem that they have. Uh, the symptoms are persistent. Uh, recurrent pathological gambling, preoccupation with gambling, of course. Reliving past gambling experiences. This is a hint and a warning. When you get into counseling uh, and you start counseling people that smoke a lot of pot, people that uh, drink a lot of alcohol, and now they're recovering alcoholics or pot smokers or whatever they, whatever they were doing, uh, they're going to tell you stories about when they were drunk, when they were stoned. And that's all they're going to talk about. That's all they're going to want to talk about. All their best stories are when they were drunk. Uh, good I had a good friend who was a Korean War veteran, uh, had been sober for 23 years, um, and, uh, and this guy had been married three times, had six kids. He never talked about his kids. He never talked about his wives. Uh, I thought his wife was his sister. That's how bad it was. He never talked about her like he was, she was his wife. All the, all the stories he ever told had to do with when he was drinking. Once a, one time when I was drinking, we went to the bar in Chinook. We went to the bar in Haver. And we went to the cowboy bar. It's always cowboy bars because he's a cowboy. He's also an Indian. <laughs> but he was a cowboy. <laughs> but so he, all, all, all the stories he told, and he was a runner. And he had won all kinds of interesting races, but he never talked about when he ran. He never, and I was a runner, and I, didn't, I wasn't a drinker, but by God, I would take, we would go to a, a run someplace, and of course in Montana, everything's 150 miles away. So we would be riding in the car, and all, all he ever talked about was when he was drinking. I did this, and then I did that. I woke up with somebody, and I didn't realize that She, was, she wasn't my wife. <laughs> he knew that. Okay, so this is one of the things that we're, you need to remember is that uh, these individuals, th this becomes iconic for them. Whether they're gamblers, whether they're hoarders, whether they are drinkers, whatever their problem is, they're going to relive the past on a continual basis. Uh, and potentially that's part of their recovery. Uh, this, like I said, this guy hadn't had a drink in 23 years, um, and he worked with uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> but all the stories he told had to had to do with when he was a drinker. Uh, fascinating stuff. So they're <laughs> reliving their their uh, negative days, I guess. Uh, and of course, uh, this individual uh, is still a pathological gambler, so they will plan for future gambling. Uh, increasing the amount of money used in gambling. Oh, something happened over the weekend. Uh, Japanese. 
<laughs> the Japanese. Jap there's, a, there's a group of people that live, the indigenous people of, of the uh, Japanese islands, or a group called the Ainu. Uh, they were Caucasian, as strange as that may seem. Siberian. They were from Siberia. Uh, anyway, they were there before the Japanese got there. Uh, Japanese are actually from the Chinese mainland. Uh, the Japanese admitted over the weekend that those people existed. <laughs> it's a first. I mean, these people have been there forever. You know, the Japanese got there, what, in 12,000 12, A.D.? And for 800 years, they've denied that they even existed. Uh, we, went, we used to go to parades uh, in Japan, and they would depict these people as monsters. Not as humans, but as monsters. Uh, so they, have, they had no status whatsoever in Japan. It's really kind of interesting. But they admitted over the weekend that, they, that the Ainu uh, actually existed. Uh, kind of fascinating. These are the guys that uh, tattoo their mouths. The women tattoo their mouths with a mustache and a beard. Yeah, they put things around their mouths. Anyway, they are a denigrated group in in, in, uh, in Japan. But they have admitted, well, it just happened on Saturday, actually, that uh, the Ainu actually existed. They live in Hokkaido, which is the, the big island on, you know, the head of the dragon. And then in... Uh, Hachinohe, the, <clears throat> that prefect right there, just below the uh, uh, Hokkaido, which is where I used to live. I used to live over there. It was, it was interesting because they, if you're, if you're a, uh, I knew you can't uh, rent property. You don't have a status. It's really kind of fascinating. Uh, so, of course, being from the United States, I didn't understand any of this stuff. Any, anyway, interesting stuff. In, in, uh, increasing the amount of money used in, in gambling, uh, unsuccessful attempts at shopping or curbing gambling, stopping or curbing gambling, restlessness and irritability when not gambling, using gambling as an escape, and of course that's very common. You're, this, is, this is your coping technique. Uh, chasing, trying to uh, recoup your past losses. Uh, if you've ever been around a gambler, they're always trying to uh, catch up with where they were before. Uh, and, of course, they don't talk about how much money they owe. They don't talk about how much money they've lost. They always talk about how much money they want. Uh, I had a friend uh, up in uh, Montana who uh, was a gambler, and uh, if, he, if he gambled, uh, okay, this is what happened. Every day, um, he, he helped me fix my house when I went back. So I was giving him, how much money did I give him? I think I gave him $100 a day. I was paying him $100 a day, and every day he wanted me to pay him, so I did. I just paid him, um, and um, the next day I'd ask him, well, how much, oh, he, he'd say, I, I went to the, the casino last night, and I said, well, how much do you have left? He never had any money left. He lost, he lost $100 every night, and we, I was there for about 10 days, so he lost a thousand dollars, lost every penny I gave him. <clears throat> uh, but when I would when I would ask him uh, how much did he lose, he would say, "Oh, I don't know, but I won like I, I won six jackpots, and they were worth six hundred and seventy-five dollars." And I'd say, "Well, how much do you have left?" Nothing. So he would talk about how much he won, but he wouldn't admit that he lost it all. That's that was the curious thing about my friend. And sometimes he'd be there all night long. Uh, and I pick him up at the uh, at the cafeteria, and uh, I'd have to buy him breakfast because he never had any money left. Uh, and that's I guess that's not that funny, but he always told me how much he won that night. <laughs> but it was all gone. I don't know. I guess I guess winning something, whether you lose it or not, is, is all that's important. That's the point. You understand this, Chris? Right? It's not how much. <laughs> They have left over how much they won during the night. Uh, and that's known as chasing. Uh, lying about gambling, and of course, uh, gamblers are liars. Uh, from time to time, yeah, it would take until you know noon, lunchtime, before he'd tell me that he actually lost all of his money. Uh, financing gambling through illegal acts. Uh, he uh, uh, would sell things. He was a fence, is what he was. So people would steal stuff, uh, and they would use him as a fence. And then he would sell it, and since he didn't know where it came from, 
he, he felt like he was okay. <laughs> Despite the fact the person that, uh, that sold it to him was uh, kind of sh uh, shady. Uh, jeopardizing job relationship and education to gamble, expecting others to bail out the gambler's debt, and of course that happens all the time. Uh, I had a friend that uh, was a um, alcoholic, and uh, the way he, he uh, stopped becoming an al being an alcoholic was by picking up another addiction, and the other addiction was gambling. So he would borrow money from me from, for all kinds of reasons. I'll tell you what, he came up with the best stories in the world. And I'd lend him the money, and of course it had to do with the fact that he, he was, had been gambling and I was paying off his gambling debt, which was better than buying him alcohol, I guess. Well, at least I, anyway. Unfortunately, he couldn't be trusted with money, so, um, and he would uh, uh, try to get uh, control of money at, uh, you know, powwow committees and whatnot. He tried to get on these committees so that he would have access to the cash. Uh, and then his idea was that he was going to double the cash or triple the cash, and he would, uh, he'd lose it all. Uh, because he was a gambler, he, he just needed to play, he didn't need to win. In the beginning, uh, the bets are small and they, they are happy just to win or break even. Uh, this is in the winning phase. But as, as the recreation becomes compulsion, uh, the reward becomes more the stimulation of the action and they seek to prolong the action as long as they possibly can. Winning becomes secondary to staying in the game. One of the worst things that, that happened to, the, uh, to Fort Belknap Reservation was that they opened a casino. Um, and it was opened by the Chickasaw. It wasn't opened by the by the natives there. They didn't have enough. They didn't have any capital. They couldn't have opened the casino. But it was opened by the Chick Ch Chickasaw tribe, which is an Oklahoma tribe. Of course. Well, they are now. They used to be over over in uh, Alabama and Mississippi and uh, Georgia. Uh, but uh, they opened it, and uh, and they make a lot of money. The problem is, of course, that uh, uh, most of the money that they make. Is is uh, is from the native population. It's not from uh, the white population driving through. Uh, it's from mostly the uh, Indian population. So all they're doing, they open a casino, and now the cas the casino is making money hand over fist, and it's all it's all Indian money, unfortunately. And it's it's my friend, it's my friends, you know those those individuals that uh, I've been talking about. Uh, it's kind of a tragedy, I guess. <clears throat> anyway, they try to stay in the game. Uh, in 70 to 80 percent of the cases with compulsive gamblers, the beginning of their craving for gambling started with a big win, of course. That Remember the $200,000 you guys just made? Well, as soon as you need money, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to start playing the lottery. Uh, well, before you were just buying a ticket, maybe two tickets. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to be buying 100 tickets or 150 tickets or 200 tickets. <clears throat> That's the way to win, you know. You've got to buy more tickets. So here you're trying to... You're trying to, do, to uh, recoup your losses. Uh, the losing phase, the losing phase begins with a losing streak, uh, which is inevitable uh, due to the simple laws of chance. Uh, their large losses are met with larger wages to try to recoup their previous losses, and of course this is known as chasing. They're trying to, to catch up. Uh, they can accumulate a lot of debt. And, ga and the uh, gambling casinos will allow them to, to accumulate a lot of, of debt. They, they will allow them to do that. Even if they, uh, think about it, what in the world, uh, how much money does it cost for me to lose $100,000? How much does, does the casino put out so that I can lose $100,000? How much do they spend? Well, they gotta hire somebody to, to uh, serve me drinks, that's $10 an hour. There's another person that's a dealer, that's $15 an hour. Well, it's just $25. So for $25, they have to uh, overhead for the building, let's say it's $100, that's still $125, and I just lost $100,000. So for $125, they have, have uh, made a profit of $100,000. Costs them nothing. Uh, so I owe them $100,000, but I don't have $100,000, but I, I have $10,000. So they will allow me to pay that money back in, in installments of $10,000. Uh, I have to pay them $10,000 a month. Um, but, of course, it's going to be extended by one month. Uh, every month I don't pay back the $100,000. Then uh, they, they charge interest. 
like 10, 20%, whatever. So they don't have to make all the $100,000 back. They just have to make $125 to break even. Do you see how it works? This is a good deal for them. And, and now all of a sudden they're way, way ahead. If I pay them once, they're way ahead. So it, whether I pay them back $100,000 or just $10,000, they're still way, way ahead. So I can accumulate all the losses I, or all the, the, yeah, all the losses I want. And this is known as chasing, of course. I'm trying to make enough money to pay off my, my gambling. As the gambler continues to lose, they will dip into, into depression. Uh, they will seek isolation, become irritable, and they will lie about their situation. Um, gamblers are liars just like alcoholics are liars. Uh, anybody that has an addiction is a liar. Uh, they will do anything to maintain their, uh, to maintain whatever it is that they are addicted to. to keep doing it. <clears throat> The desperation phase and the desperation phase of pathological gambler may lose their job, they may max out their credit cards, they may bar borrow money from friends and family, uh, perhaps turn uh, to illegal activities to hide their addiction, uh, theft, embezzlement, drug dealing. Uh, potentially, and we're, not, we're still not sure exactly what was going on with the uh, uh, Las Vegas shooter, uh, but it's possible that this individual had been on one of these losing phases He's a winner, he's a loser, he gets, gets into the desperation phase. He decides that the, the, uh, uh, that, uh, the whole system is great against him. And so he decides to pay them back by, by killing as many people as he possibly can. That's a possibility. I mean, there is no pathology that we have seen here except the fact that he was a professional gambler. Profession, in order to win as a professional gambler, you don't drink nearly as much. Uh, you got to keep a lucid mind. Uh, you don't want to, uh, to to slip. You don't want to get angry. Uh, in his case, the only time he got angry was when he fell down at a casino. He was on a he was on a losing binge. Uh, fell down at a casino and he couldn't get them to pay him any money. Uh, that's the only time that we have seen that he was angry. Curious, isn't it? So it may be that this guy blasted away at Las Vegas just to pay him back for all the all the, the negative things that had happened to him in Las Vegas. The gambler may ba bankrupt their family and suffer divorce, of course. Somebody's got to pay for his problems. Giving up phase, uh, in the giving up phase, the gambler is no longer trying to recoup their losses, <coughs> but seeks the game to stay in the action. 72% of gamblers experience depression when they hit bottom. Uh, the question is, how, what, where is bottom? Well, it, it all depends on how much they want. If they've won as much as a uh, million dollars, then potentially they'll have to lose a million dollars before they feel like they've hit bottom. They know that they can make that back. They know, however much money they've uh, uh, made in their lives at, had at one time, that's what they feel like they can, uh, they can lose. So bottom is beyond that. So if they've won $100,000, then $100,000 is, is hitting bottom for them, or $125,000. Because they know they can make $100,000 just by doing the same thing. Of course, it doesn't work that way. Cards are cards, I guess. Suicide attempts occur in 17 to 24% of these gamblers when, they, uh, when the bottom was hit. Uh, remember, these are fairly lucid individuals. Uh, they are depressed, uh, but they don't show it. And this is one of the reasons why they are able to commit suicide. Most people, when they hit bottom, when they are the lowest that they will ever be, uh, those individuals cannot co commit suicide at that stage. They have to start recovering from the suicide before they can actually uh, kill themselves. But this is usually the time when the gambler seeks treatment, of course, when they hit bottom. Um, it's their last, it's their last ditch effort uh, to get out of it. Now, gambling is a problem. Can be a problem. It's compulsion. It's com it's it's a compulsive situation. Uh, there was a television show, Mom. I don't know. It's about it's about a mother that's an alcoholic and a daughter that's an alcoholic. But the daughter's also a compulsive gambler, and the mother gets arrested at one point, and uh, she has money. She has rent money, and she's going to pay her use her rent money to uh, to get her mother out of jail. Uh, her mother's in Las Vegas, unfortunately, and she passes a slot machine and she, she dumps all of her money. And then she borrows money from a friend. 
and uh, she's headed to the, the uh, uh, she's headed to the jail again. And by golly, she hit, she passes another slot machine, tries to win back what she has just lost. She loses the whole whole thing. So she's lost two piles of money, and her mother's still in jail. As interesting as that is, that's the way gamblers that this, this compulsive gambling works. You can't control yourself. You have to gamble. You always know that the next big hit, the next big score, is the next time you play. You feel like that's what's going to happen, so you have to gamble. Uh, for the compulsive gambler, it isn't the money that they are seeking, but the rush from the large win and the zoning out that gambling affords them. About one-third of compulsive gamblers recover on their <coughs> own, usually triggered by devastating financial losses. Uh, and usually the fi financial losses are paid off by somebody a family member, and then, then of course they owe the family member for the rest of their lives, <clears throat> because I, it's, it's easy to win and lose a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand uh, dollars, but it's hard to make that much money. I mean, it take me four years to make two hundred thousand dollars. That's if I didn't eat <laughs> and I lived on the ground. <laughs> uh, that'd be pleasant. <laughs> For the other two-thirds who seek treatment, the techniques used include antidepressant medication, uh, anti-craving drugs such as naltrexone uh, to block uh, the uh, dopamine loop in your brain, and of course, Gamblers Anonymous, which is always interesting, Gamblers Anonymous. So Gamblers Anonymous is just like Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a 12-step program, and step five is apologizing to all the people that you've hurt. So, you ever get a call from somebody? I've, I've had those calls. <laughs> and the, that call from my second wife, as interesting as that is. Compulsive shoppers and hoarders have the same cravings as do gamblers and drug addicts, uh, but in this, the high is caused by the feeling they, that they get when they purchase an item. 74% of the time, compulsive buyers purchase items on impulse. I hope none of you are compulsive buyers. Shoppers, uh, geez, you go to Walmart. My daughter, when she goes to, to uh, Target, she has to buy something. Her favorite place is TJ Maxx. I don't know if you've ever been to TJ Maxx. All the clothes are like really, really cheap. And there's all kinds of interesting things around the store. Uh, she just loves to, to find uh, a, a perfect, this, this, this uh, shirt is from TJ Maxx. She thinks she got it for like five bucks. And then she gave it to me for Christmas. It's a Hawaiian shirt, you know. <laughs> anyway, she found a TJ Maxx for you know on the on the sale rack, and it just happened to be in my size, so she couldn't she couldn't help herself. She had to buy it. Uh, Fifty percent of the household income for these compulsive shoppers uh, goes to paying for their shopping uh, debts. As stupid as that sounds. If you need it, you need it. If you don't, you don't. But of course, that's not the way it works. If you see a good deal, you have to buy a good deal. I'll tell you about the purple pants my first wife bought me. This was way back in the 1970s when nobody wore purple pants. Anyway, she bought me purple pants. <clears throat> Uh, I never wore those pants, as curious as that is. And she always asked me, why aren't you wearing your purple pants? <laughs> that may be why we never, why we're not together anymore. <laughs> because of those damn purple pants. Compulsive shoppers, I didn't have any shoes to go with them, okay? And what, what color shirt do you wear with a purple pair of pants? <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't like purple, it wasn't a color that you've ever seen. It was like an off color of purple. And there's, I don't know, there's, nobody makes any other clothes that, that would go with those pants. <clears throat> and they were tight. They were really tight. Oh, wait a minute. This is when guys were wearing leather pants and when they were, were wearing parachute pants. Remember? Oh, sorry. I'm just trying to explain. I never wore those damn purple pants. I wanted to cut the, the legs off and make them into shorts. You can wear any color shorts you want. Pants, you know, what kind of a jacket could you wear with a pair of, pur pair of purple pants? 
Compulsive shoppers tend to buy items that enhance their sense of uniqueness. There you go, purple pen. Uh, women buy jewelry, clothes, and cosmetics. Uh, my mother-in-law, my current mother-in-law, well, she's dead, but uh, the mother of my current wife, how oh, I can say that, okay. The mother of my current wife was a um, compulsive uh, uh, buyer of uh, kitchen utensils, kitchen things. Uh, so she had mixers and she had all cutters, you know, it, just strange things. So when she died, she, you know, they opened her closet and here's all this stuff. And half of it still had the price tags on it. Uh, and it was, it was gourmet cooking stuff. That, uh, you know, like a, a, a apple core, the automatic apple core, an apple peeler, and things for avocados, you know, garlic presses, automatic garlic presses. None of this is making any sense to you guys, but this lady <laughs> bought just piles and piles of this stuff. And if she didn't have one, she had to have, you know, three or four just in case she was having a party, which she never had parties. But if she ever had a party, she would need, and one of them broke, then she would need a second one, right? And this is how she got her husband, uh, so he became part of this compulsion. And uh, in order to, for him to show his love for her, he had to buy her all this crap that she never used. And she just put it in her, in her closet. She had a, a walk-in closet uh, off of her uh, kitchen. It was the size, it was like a garage. I mean, it was huge. And so, when she died and we went in to clean the place out, what do you do with that stuff? I mean, most of that stuff, who uses an avocado core or whatever? Who eats avocados? In Georgia. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How many people make guacamole in Georgia? How do you find avocados in Georgia? <clears throat> anyway. Uh, so women buy jewelry, clothes, cosmetics, and in my mother-in-law's case, it was uh, kitchen appliances. Uh, men buy high-tech electronics. She had five, um, what are those things, uh, toaster ovens. She had a stove. She had, a, she, had a, she had everything that she needed, and she had five toaster ovens. ovens. Three of them were still in the box, and two of them were just sitting there. I think she'd used them once or twice. Anyway, toaster ovens. So if anybody needs a toaster oven. Uh, men buy high-tech electronics and sporting equipment. Uh, men will buy uh, fishing equipment, and then they never go fishing. Uh, they need a new bass boat, but they never go out on the, on the lake. Uh, you know, that kind of stupid stuff. Or uh, men will accumulate guns and ammunition, even though they never shoot. Um, and, and they, you know, they, they never clean the guns so they get all rusted out and, and whatnot. Depression seems to be the main impetus uh, behind the, uh, their compulsive shopping. Uh, it seems worse during the winter holidays. So uh, this is the time when they accrue 40% of their debt. Antidepressants reduce their urge to compulsive shop. Uh, so some of it may have something to do with uh, seasonal affective disorder, uh, where because it's so dark, they, <laughs> they get depressed. Collecting, accumulating, and hoarding are offshoots of compulsive shopping. Uh, I've had uh, students write about this. Evidently, this is very common on the Navajo Reservation, uh, especially the hoarding uh, and accumulating, not especially the collecting, but the, the uh, uh, accumulating and hoarding. Uh, so people will have, well, I told you, I, my neighbor's got four vehicles. There's only, he's the only driver in the family. And he's got four vehicles. Two of them are cars that he never drives, that he has for parts for each other, I guess. Uh, then he has two trucks, and they're just parked right in my, in my yard. <laughs> as fun as that is. I have, so I have, a, I have a white Chevy, and I've got a green Chevy. Uh, the white Chevy, the paint's coming off of it. It's, you know, cooks off how that stuff works. Anyway, he's got four cars. Uh, he's got two uh, storage areas full of stuff. The individuals gain self-worth and self-esteem from the objects that they own. These collectors and hoarders may buy valuable items, uh, contemporary fads, or accumulate valueless items. Uh, there are cases of people who are, who are unable to throw away newspapers and magazines. Um, there was a lawyer in Omaha 
I was working at the emergency room. Where was I? I was at Bergen Mercy Hospital. And I was working in the emergency room, and they called us out. She had broken her leg. Uh, so I went out with them, and I can't remember why I went out with them. I went out with the, the EMTs. It wasn't that far away. It was only four or five blocks away. Uh, we got there. We knocked on the door. Uh, they opened the door, and I'll tell you what. The smell of cat urine just about knocked you out. It was nasty. <clears throat> anyway, so they... the. Her, uh, she had a girlfriend, uh, and that, that that girlfriend let us in, and it was a path. It was a path. Everything was was all the way up to the ceiling. She had newspapers. She had magazines. She had papers, all over the place. And 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 she's she was a big woman too. She was bigger than me. She weighed probably I don't know close to two hundred pounds. So she was kind of big. And by golly, I had to go sideways in order to get through those paths. And she kept saying, be careful. That wasn't the lady, the, the lawyer, it was, a, it was a girlfriend. And she kept saying, be careful, don't knock, the, don't knock anything down. Don't knock anything down. And here's the, all three of us are you know, going to be sideways like that. And of course, the two, <laughs> the two AMTs have got a, a stretcher. Uh, they tried to bring in the uh, wheeled stretcher, but they couldn't, they couldn't get it through. Uh, so they had to bring in the... Uh, one with the, the handles. Uh, and we went back to the back bedroom. And I'll tell you what, that place was packed everywhere. I, I, I'm sure there was a kitchen in there somewhere, but I'm not exactly sure where it was. Uh, there was so much paper. Uh, and everything was stacked right up to the, the ceiling. And of course, you know, there are cats all over the place. Using the newspaper for, you know, to go to, to use the, the restroom. No, no cat box. Anyway, <laughs> so we got back to the back, and of course she'd broken her leg, and she was a mess. Um, her um, <clears throat> hygiene wasn't very good. She wasn't eating very well. Her bones were really thin. Uh, we put her on the stretcher, and we, we kind of hauled her out, and it was a trick because the stretcher was just about, just a little bit too big for the, the path that they had. And here we are, we're trying to not knocked anything over, and we did. We knocked a couple stacks over. Of course, they screamed at us. I'm gonna sue you, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, we got her back and cleaned her up. She smelled like cat urine. It was a, it was a mess. Anyway, uh, they wouldn't let her in court anymore because she smelled so bad. She was a lawyer, she was a brilliant lawyer, but they wouldn't let her in court because she stunk. Anyway, she was a hoarder, hoarder of cat urine and newspapers as horrible as that is. These collectors and hoarders may buy valuable items, contemporary fads, or accumulate valueless uh, items. There are cases of people who are unable to throw away newspapers and magazines. Uh, there was a case of a lady uh, and her husband. Uh, they uh, raised um, uh, collies, it's a special type of collie, ugly. You know, you've seen Lassie on television. She's got that, you know, red and black and white. She's really pretty. Uh, these were gray and beige and, and white, kind of an off-white. So they weren't very attractive dogs. Uh, but she, they raised them, and they, uh, they came across. They were moving down here. They were moving to Arizona from Alaska. They had bred dogs up in Alaska, and they were driving a semi-trailer. They stopped them at the border. They had to come through Canada, of course, and they stopped them at the border. And when they opened up the back of the uh, semi, it was full of dogs uh, in cages. And uh, they started pulling dogs out, uh, and they found 127 dogs, all, all, almost all collies, uh, and three of them were dead. Uh, of course, they were stacked on top of each other, so they were defecating and urinating on top of each other, as ugly as that sounds. Anyway, they, so they confiscated all of them. They were trying to decide. Uh, the state of Montana was trying to decide what to do with them. They took them out to the fairgrounds in Great Falls. Uh, they housed them all in, uh, in one of the uh, barns in, uh, uh, in Great Falls. They gave them all away. Um, they charged her with animal cruelty, uh, with transporting, uh, something about transporting animals across, <laughs> across the border or something. It was really kind of interesting. Anyway, they took all their dogs except one. Three, I'm sorry, there were three. 
and the, the dogs that they took were not collies. Uh, they were, they, the judge allowed them to have three dogs, and they took dogs that weren't collies, which was kind of curious. So they gave all the collies away. Ah, as weird as that is. A lot of hoarders up, up north in, in Montana. Uh, there was a case of a, a guy that raised goats, and he decided that uh, he had all these goats, and he had had all these goats on, on his property for an extended length of time. Well, he died, and there wasn't anybody to feed the goats. Uh, the goats finally ate up all the grass. They couldn't escape because he had them all pinned in, and they all died. They, they starved to death. 250 goats uh, on his property. Dead goats, of course, as ugly as that is. <laughs> Hoarders. <laughs> so I hope you guys don't have any people like that. <laughs> Weird people live in Montana, I don't know. Not, well, but just those, the one lady is from Alaska. And she lives here now, so. She's probably accumulating dogs again, be careful. In 1980, 15% of adult population in the United States were considered obese. Uh, by 2005, 33% of the adult U.S. population were considered obese. Uh, tragically, only 33% of the adult population are of normal weight. So only one-third of us are normal, as sad as that is. The average height of the United States female is 5 foot 4, and she weighs 164 pounds. The average model in the United States is 5 foot 9, and she weighs 110 pounds. Oh, wait a minute. So the ideal weight is, is, uh, is much uh, lower than the actual weight. This is what 164 pounds, 5 foot 4, 164 pounds looks like. This is what uh, 5 foot uh, 9 and 110 pounds looks like. So all the fashion models, everybody that you see in the magazines and on the runways, this is the way they look, but this is the way that most women in the United States actually look, as weird as that is. Let's do it again. This is what a model looks like. You can see your bony legs. Uh, and this is what they act, this is what women actually look like. She's actually 170 pounds. 170 pounds of five foot, foot four. And the other lady, of course, is very slender. Five foot nine, 110 pounds. Let's do it again. One more time. Okay. <laughs> this is what five foot four. 164 pounds looks like, and this is what 100, 110 pounds at 5 foot 9 looks like. <clears throat> so we have uh, these unrealistic expectations. This is our expe expectations, and this is the way we actually looked. So here we are, we're, we've got this cognitive dissonance going on. What's the probability that, that anybody will look like this? What's, wh who would want to look like this? That looks too skinny to me. When I was in the service, uh, one of my jobs was uh, the weight control program. Well, almost everybody on the weight control program was a little bigger than they were supposed to be. Almost everybody. But we had one lady <clears throat> that looked like this. Guess which lady they kicked out of the service? Her. Yeah. She was too small. She was too slender. They had to kick her out. They couldn't send her anywhere. They were afraid that if she went someplace, she would break into you know, little pieces, like a matchstick. So they couldn't do anything with her. The women that were a little bit overweight, they were that was fine. No problem. Those ladies stayed in the service. Uh, their, their weight tended to fluctuate. Her weight never fluctuated. And by golly, I had her lifting weights, and I had her drinking milkshakes, and nothing. She, couldn't gain, she wouldn't gain weight. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure why. I have a feeling that she was going home and throwing herself up, throwing up. Uh, but she, they kicked her out of the service because she couldn't make weight, as it were. Anyway, <laughs> as weird as that is. There are three eating disorders. Anorexia nervosa is one of them. Uh, these individuals have uh, body image distortion, and they are addicted to losing weight. Just like... Uh, uh, the young lady that I was talking about, is this anorexic? Would you call this anorexic? I probably would. And it all really all depends on what, how, how her mind uh, works, whether she has a body distortion or not. 
but that, that's way too slender. It's just way, way too slender. Bulimia nervosa is far more common than anorexia. Uh, these, these individuals kill themselves uh, very frequently. It's not that they commit suicide. Uh, they are not healthy. Uh, you need uh, uh, fat on your body in order to be healthy. And so these individuals uh, will die of heart failure because they don't, uh, they can't maintain themselves because of the fat. If they ever get sick, they die. They get sick, if they get sick with the flu, they don't have the reserves uh, to uh, recover. Uh, I had a friend that, a uh, very, very slender guy, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I just communicated with him. He's like six foot four and weighs like 150 pounds. He's six six, I'm sorry, six six and weighs 100, 150 pounds. Uh, really skinny. And I've talked to him about this before. I tried to talk him into how many push ups can you do? You know, let's, I'll match you in push-ups. Well, geez, he's tall. He's really long, so when he does a push-up, I mean, it takes him forever to get up. Me, you know, my arms are so short, I just bounce up and down. But, uh, so, but I'm trying to talk him into gaining weight, and uh, every time he gets sick, he's sick for weeks. Catches pneumonia. Uh, if he ca catches a cold, it turns into pneumonia. As sad as that is. Anyway, so he's kind of anorexic. Uh, he thinks he's going to live longer than any, anybody else. But the reality is if you're too slender, when you become an older individual, you're more likely to die because you don't have the reserves that somebody that's larger has. Uh, so when we talk about old people, and when I'm talking about old, I'm talking about people older than I am, okay? Uh, 75, 80 year old people, uh, if they are too slender, they're not long for this world. It, uh, that's just the way it works. They need to have a little bit of body mass in order to have reserves in case they get sick. Anyway, anorexia nervosa, a bad body image distortion. Bulimia nervosa is eating excessive amounts of food and then controlling your weight by purging. Uh, you can vomit, you can fast. Uh, excessive exercise is another way that they do it. Uh, now the interesting thing about my friend is that he's anorexic. As I said, he's got a girlfriend and she's bulimic. <laughs> I don't know how this goes together, <clears throat> uh, but she exercises excessively. Uh, she lives in, uh, she works in St. Louis, uh, but she lives on the outside of, uh, outskirts of St. Louis. She bicycles 38 miles a day, back and forth to work. 38 miles in St. Louis, which they don't have bicycling lanes. Kind of, kind of silly. Anyway, she exercises excessively. Binge eating is eating excessive amounts of food with no attempt at weight control. At weight control. Compulsive eaters uh, feel powerless when dealing with food. These individuals tend to be obsessed with food. They use fo food to escape undesirable feelings, boredom, or depression. Uh, secretive behavior. Uh, they have secretive behavior. They feel guilty when they uh, when they can't control their their eating. Uh, they are they are in denial that they are overweight. And unfortunately, they continue overeating behavior despite the harm that it's doing them. They don't exercise. Uh, if they were planning to go to Gallup, they would uh, they would be thinking about where they were going to eat lunch and then maybe a snack or a tide me by, as some people call it. Uh, on their way out of town, so they would eat at, at 5.05. And I ate at 5.05 last week. Thank you for uh, suggesting 5.05. The food was okay. I've never seen that many french fries on a plate before. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of french fries. I couldn't find my hamburger for all the french fries. Uh, and I was thinking, my goodness, and that's a lot of food. It really, and the hamburger was big too. Um, it was a lot of food. It was, it was a little bit more food than I really wanted. Anyway, 505. But if, it, if, if uh, this, you had a compulsive eater, of course they would plan where they were going to go. I'm going to go to 505, I'll eat lunch, and then on my way out of town I'll pick up a, a, a lot of burger at Blake's. And just, just for the road, you know. <clears throat> So they would, they would have these plans as to where they were going to eat and what they were going to drink. They don't want to drink uh, diet. Well, maybe they would drink a diet. 
Diet Coke, but they probably drink a, a milkshake. And personally, I don't like the milkshakes at Blake's. They're a little too, I don't know. Have you tried Jerry's? Jerry's? Are you sending me someplace else? <laughs> <laughs> Is this anywhere clo close to where I'm shopping? Do I have to go? It's downtown. You know where there's very more. See, I just, that's the only road I go on in Gallup. And then I jump on 40 and I head to Albuquerque. I stayed at that uh, that fancy hotel one time. My wife had stayed at that. No, 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 no. It's uh, uh, the one that uh, John Wayne stayed at when he was making The what? Yeah, El Rancho. Yeah, I stayed there. <laughs> So where is Jerry's compared to all those places? My wife used to buy leather down, downtown, but she's been gone for two years. It's not too far from there. Yeah. Electric tree shop? Yeah. She buys leather? Yeah. About one street down. One street down. Yeah. It's a small place. Just a small place. Good food. Good food? A lot of food? No, not that much. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I'm, it's not like a plate of French fries. Jerry's Cafe. Jerry's Cafe. Okay, I'll I'll remember that the next time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. That's what I'm after. Going back in time. <laughs> I want to be younger. Yeah. <laughs> Eating disorders seem to be a combination of genetic, uh, neurochemical, psychological development, and sociocultural factors. <laughs> 9.3 percent of the U.S. adult population is diabetic. That's 19,300 people. 19,300,000 people, I'm sorry. 26 percent of the U.S. adult population are at risk for diabetes. That's 54 million people. 54 million people just because they can't control their food. Uh, or because they're buying cheap food and there's a lot of sugar in cheap food. 15.5% uh, of American Indian adults has diabetes. Uh, some tribes are worse than others. The Pueblo tribes tend to have more people with diabetes than, uh, than the other tribes, than the Plains tribes. 10% of African American adults has diabetes. 6.5% of Mexican American adults has diabetes. 5.6% of white adults has diabetes. It is not uncommon for someone with an eating disorder to have a co-occurring disorder as well. 12-18% uh, of anorexics abuse tobacco, alcohol, amphetamines, prescription drugs, or over-the-counter substances. Like dextromethorphan, the, uh, the stuff that's in cough syrup. 30-70% to 70 of bulimics abuse tobacco, alcohol, amphetamines, prescription drugs, or over-the-counter substances. Uh, potentially these individuals are D. DRD2A1 people, just like all of our other friends that have problems with this stuff. Uh, most eating disorders begin during adolescence. Uh, they tend to be chronic and affect women more than men. 3% uh, of uh, women suffer from one of the three eating disorders. In high school, 33% of girls and 16% of boys show symptoms of one of the eating disorders. This is Snooki. You remember Snooki. She was one of the Itali Italian ladies on Jersey Shore. This is Snooki when she was in high school. When she was a cheerleader. Snooki's only four foot eight, I think. I think she's only four foot eight. Anyway, she's not from the United States. Snooki is a, was adopted out of Peru. She's Quechua. 100% Quechua. She's native. But of course, she wa she ran around with all those Italian people who who uh, suntanned all the time and lifted weights. If, if this Snooky looks like the Snooky that you remember on television, then you're not remembering the right television show. She was anorexic in high school, <clears throat> and then she gained a lot of weight when she was on the television show. Uh, eventually, what happened to her was that after the television show stopped. She became anorexic again. She lost a ton of weight. And what saved her life, potentially, was the fact that she got pregnant. And then she couldn't, uh, she didn't uh, do those stupid things like trying to lose a lot of weight, not with a baby in her belly. And she's had two kids now by this time. 
So that saved her life, in essence, it saved her life. But this is what Snoopy looked like in high school. And as you can see, she was rail thin. She was a very, very slender uh, young lady. And on the television show, she was much larger. One of the frightening statistics dealing with anorexia is that the age of onset has dropped from 13 years to 9 years. So we have third graders that are becoming anorexic. This is kind of scary. Uh, used to be uh, seventh graders. Now it's third graders. As stupid as that sounds. Third grade girls are starting to diet and starve themselves to look thin. Anorexics seem to, be, to have a fear of get, gaining weight. Uh, these individuals tend to have a tendency to perfectionism and a low self-esteem. Death rates for anorexics ranges from 4 to 20 percent. One out of every five dies. It's, a, it's not very healthy to be an anorexic. Bulimia nervosa is a, is a disorder characterized by binge eating and the obsessively uh, ridding oneself of the food that they have uh, been eat it, eaten, that has been eaten, uh, vomiting, laxatives, diuretics, excessive exercising are ways that they lose weight. I was telling you about my friend's girlfriend. She bicycles 38 miles a day. <laughs> fast. She goes fast. She races cars. That's what kind of a girl she is. Bulimia actually uh, means uh, ox hunger, as in hungry enough to eat an ox. Bulimia, that's what it means. Uh, when binging, these individuals eat as, as if they were famished uh, to the point of uncomfortably distending their stomachs. So if you see somebody who is a, a bulimic, uh, when they're binge eating, they look pregnant because their abdomen pooches out. Uh, these individuals are notorious for eating and purging in secret. Uh, bulimic will often have secret stashes of forbidden food stashed away throughout their house uh, that they can eat in private and purge quickly. And this happened to me with, with my wife. Uh, she was hiding cookies in the bathroom. And I thought, just thought that was the oddest thing in the world. I'd never... My, me and my kids are, are fairly healthy individuals. We're athletic. We, you know, my kids did, had, had a sport every, every season. Uh, so, and my wife's not that way, but uh, when she started hiding cookies, I knew that there was something going on. Something strange. So I confronted her about it and she stopped hiding the cookies. I mean, if she wants to eat the damn cookies. Just eat the damn cookies. You don't have to go in the bathroom to eat your cookies. What a dumb place to eat food is in the bathroom. Uh, much of the, the cause of bulimia in particular and eating disorders in general stems from the perceptions of acceptable appearance for females on television. And if we look at uh, women on television, a lot of times, well, in the old days, they were a lot skinnier than they are today. Uh, I, I was uh, watching a video the other day uh, of, uh, wait a minute, um, it was, uh, what was the damn movie? Uh, it had Rachel Ward in it. Anyway, Rachel Ward was so skinny, she looked skeletal. It was really kind of scary. Uh, it was a movie from the 80s was that? Against All Odds. If you've ever seen the movie Against All Odds, uh, Rachel Ward is the, is the love interest, but she's bony. You can see, you can see the, the, uh, her wrist bones and her clavicle just sticks out like it's, I don't know, like it's a club or something. Oh, God, it's scary. Then she's got a, a bathing suit on, and you can see her shoulder bones. Oh, my God. And her scapula. Jeez. She looks like this lady, skinny. So this is a problem. This could potentially be a problem. When television was introduced to Fiji, 3% of women on the island vomited to stay slender. If you've ever been to Fiji, if you've ever been in the South Pacific, uh, those are big people. I mean, they are just big people. There's not a whole lot you can do about if you're a Samoan, you know, you're not going to be a skinny person. It's just not the way it works. You've got shoulders like this, you know, you're this tall, there's not a whole lot you can do about being tiny. Three years later, the percentage of vomiters was 15%. So that many women had decided that they needed to look like the, the women on television. Fashion models maintain a body weight 13 to 19% below that of the women that they are modeling their clothes for, and of course, that is way, way too slim. 
While binging and purging may occur millions of times a week around the United States, it is not without its negative effects. Uh, don dental com uh, complications because you're vomiting uh, your stomach acids over your teeth. A uh, greater possibility of alcohol abuse as a way of controlling things. Greater possibility of drug abuse, a high rate of depression, a greater risk of suicide, stomach acid burns to the esophagus and the throat. It's like having acid reflux. It is having acid reflux. This is uh, uh, stomach acids that are actually digesting food. So your stomach has the, uh, has the optimum amount of acids in it while you're vomiting. And of course, that acid comes up and it just fries your your, your mouth and your esophagus, and it melts your teeth, as strange and stupid as that sounds. Vomiting is not a fun thing. Does any, has there, anybody like to vomit? Nobody? I got no, no vomiters in here? I got one. <laughs> it's good for you. It's good for you, yeah, every once in a while. I feel like a good vomit is, just purges me, cleans me up. Okay. The yellow stuff that comes out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it yeah. tastes great, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that vile. Mm. There's, there's a flavor for you. <laughs> Why don't they make vile flavored drinks? <laughs> oh, they do. Whiskey. That's whiskey. Okay. Energy drinks. <laughs> of course, you lose your tooth enamel, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, heart problems, uh, arrhythmias because of the, the acid and, and whatnot. Uh, menstrual problems if you're female. You lose so much weight that your your body your weight is fluctuating so much that your uh, period becomes uh, erratic, and of course, if your period gets erratic, then it's very difficult to get pregnant. Uh, electrolyte imbalances, of course, uh, which make you insane, and that's always fun. Yeah, I know. Binge eating uh, disorder has become an international problem. For the first time in, in the history of humanity, there, is, uh, there are as many people in the world who are overweight as those who are underweight. Um, it, it's hard to feed everybody in the world. There's seven billion people, lots of Chinese, lots of people in India. People in India don't eat meat. They're all vegetarian. Most of them are vegetarians. Uh, in China, they don't eat a lot of meat either. Uh, but uh, we have places in Africa, of course, we have countries in Africa. The Sudan has been in famine for an extended length of time. So there's a lot of strange things going on. It's hard to feed 7 billion people. It's hard to find enough food for those people. Uh, one of the problems that we're having is that uh, everybody wants a Big Mac. And since everybody wants a hamburger, we have to grow all these cows. Of course, it cows fart. I don't know if you've ever been around cows, they fart. Well, that, when they pass gas, that gas is methane. The methane melts the, the ozone layer, so we're destroying the, uh, the world by trying to feed all these people. As much fun as that is. So it's tough, but here we are. We're at a point in, in our history where there's many, there are more overweight people than there are underweight people. In the United States, where obesity, obesity is defined as more than 30 pounds over one's ideal weight, Obesity has increased from 15% in 1980 to 33% in 2005. Binge eating disorder affects 4.6% of the population at large. Binge eating is eating until the individual is uncomfortably full. People tend to be eating in response to emotional states rather than true hunger signals. So how, how many times should you eat every day? Three times? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they've got names. They've got really good names, Bre breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What about supper? What about second breakfast? Oh, I'm talking, that's, that's the hobbits. Okay. So three, is three the number? Are we supposed to eat three times a day? You work in the cafeteria, and you used to work in the cafeteria. Three, three, three. That means four in Germany. Okay. <laughs> three times a day, is that it? Really? Do you exercise enough to eat three times a day? Has anybody ever worked on a farm or a ranch? Or do you really need three meals a day? You got hungry. You needed food in the morning so that you could work through until lunch. Then you needed a nice lunch so that you could work until it's time to go to, uh, to stop. Then you'd go home and eat supper, right? And you're eating supper so that you could 
maintain yourself while you're asleep. If you've ever worked on a farm, you burned off all those calories. In the old days, they used to really burn off all those calories. Do we really need three meals a day? How do you like breakfast snack? Snack? Greasy snacks. Greasy snacks. <laughs> How many meals do we need a day? Five times a day. There we go. It's just one. Three, five steaks a day. No. You need to burn off all the calories that you take in. Uh, and of course, we've got this, this idea that we need to eat three times a day. My mommy told me I was supposed to eat three times a day. Well, back in my day, 1949, I was born in 1949, back in the 50s, of course, you know, we didn't ride so much. We walked a lot. We bicycled. We didn't ride the elevator up and down in the building. We walked the stairs. We burn off all the calories. We don't. We don't do that anymore. So maybe we don't need three meals a day. I only eat twice a day. I eat. Uh, well, I drank that glass of, of uh, V8 juice, but I don't. It was like 75 calories. <clears throat> but for lunch, I'm going to eat fruit, and then I'll eat. A, I'll eat supper tonight. But that's. I, I usually burn off all those. Calories. <coughs> I usually do. Okay. Anyway. Binge, and, but I walked the damn stairs. Travis and I are only, bit, only two. No, Kiana's walking the stairs. Are you still walking the stairs? Are you still walking the stairs? Yeah, all right. <laughs> did you see the look on his face? Yeah, all right. <laughs> you, 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 did. You, you walked the stairs once. Okay. Chris is walking the stairs, right? No, not anymore. I did it all last semester. And then I was just like, why oh, this? Slacking. So I just took it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you burn a lot of calories going up and down the stairs. Uh, binge eaters affect uh, order affects 4.6% uh, uh, 4 .6 of the population at large. Uh, binge eating is eating until the individual is uncomfortably full. Uh, people tend to be eating in response to emotional states rather than the true hunger signals. And I was just talking about the hunger signals, and that's why I forgot what I was doing. These individuals tend to have frequent episodes of eat, eating large quantities of food, feeling a lack of control where food is concerned, eating rapidly and swallowing food without chewing. Um, food doesn't taste that good to me. Maybe there's a prop, Maybe there's something wrong with me. Obviously, there is. Uh, my wife, if she gets comes anywhere close to a cheesecake, she eats a lot of it, and cheesecake is so rich. I don't know how you can eat more than a bite. It's so rich. But she has to eat until she's full. Cheesecake, I don't, I don't understand it. Uh, eating rapidly and swallowing food without chewing, eating despite being uncomfortably full, eating when not feeling hungry, eating away from others so that they won't see your volume of intake, feeling disgusted because of the lack of control of, of food, and having a preference for high car carbohydrate foods with high fat content, i.e. junk food. And now, of course, isn't there a, a, a tax on junk food on the res? Yeah, okay. So the, all those Slim Jims over it, which don't really make you slim, they're just skinny, okay. Those are, they, they tax those, so they're more expensive? Is that what's going on? They did the same thing with, with tobacco. I guess that works. Binge and compulsive eaters do not uh, seem to know how to pace themselves, eating rapidly and in massive amounts until they feel painfully uncomfortable. Each eating may be done to, such eating may be done to control anxiety, uh, food uh, seems to have a calming, sedating effect on some people. Adolescents who eat when they are depressed are twice as likely to suffer from obesity or bulimia. They are also twice as likely to suffer from anorexia. So if you're eating because of depression, we got a really serious problem. Potentially, we, we have a serious problem. Compulsive overeaters are more likely to suffer from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, circulatory problems, heart disease, type 2 diabetes. Remember, there's 15 million Americans with type 2 diabetes. Sleep apnea, which is what my wife was just diagnosed with. 
uh, gallbladder disease, <clears throat> uh, gout, uh, arthritis, 15 to 60 percent uh, greater risk of cancer. They exhibit high rates of depression. They become distressed and develop develop a negative body image. They are, are allow uh, their self-esteem to suffer badly because they don't like the way that they look. <clears throat> Sorry, we have to talk about sexual addiction. I apologize. Uh, sexual addiction is marked by sexual behavior that the individual has little control over and little choice. Uh, sex should be voluntary. Uh, should always be voluntary. You should always feel like you have control over yourself uh, and you don't have to do whatever you want. Yes, sir. Gout is uh, accumulation of uric acid crystals in your joints. Uh, it's usually caused by eating excessive amounts of select things like uh, uh, fermented beverages, in other words, uh, whiskey, and wine, and beer, uh, too much fish. Uh, so rich people used to get it because they would eat all this rich food and then they would, if they were susceptible to it, they would have gout. I have gout. I developed it when I was a teenager for no reason whatsoever. But I have to control my, uh, what I can, uh, take in. I can't eat fish. Um, dairy products sometimes will make my, my toes explode. Nice. Uh, I can't eat, I can't drink beer or wine. I can't drink any of that If I do, my feet swell. It hurts like the devil. It hurts worse than you can imagine. It was like a broken broken bone. But that's what gout is. It's where crystals form in your in your joints. And the only way to alleviate it is to wait until those damn crystals dissolve. Which they're crystals. So how fast do they dissolve? Like, that's what gout is. Okay. Uric acid crystals. We don't uh, process purines very well. So there are some drugs that uh, like uh, the uh, fish, fish oil have, have a lot of purines in it. So as long as you're not susceptible to it, you can take all that stuff all you want. But if I take one, you know, my foot, foot swells up. If I eat a tuna fish sandwich, and it would be stupid for me to do that, but my, my foot would swell up. <clears throat> so, there you go. That's gout. Usually it happens in your big toe of your left foot. Strangely enough, why it's your left foot and not your right foot, nobody knows. Uh, you get it in your knee, so you just accumulate crystals in your joints. And uh, I discovered this during track season, which was, my coach was pissed. <laughs> it was really upset. <laughs> uh, you stupid. You know, he accused me of drinking too much beer, but I didn't drink at that point, so he was wrong. This type of behavior, we're talking about sexual addiction, uh, this type of behavior might be practiced by young or old, gay or straight, male or female. Uh, the addiction not only includes sexual contact with another individual, but arousal through masturbation, viewing pornography, serial affairs, phone sex, visits to topless bars, visits to strip shows. Which, and I've never been to a topless bar or a strip show. Jeez. I'm like the only military guy in the world that's never been to a strip joint. My wife has been to strip joints, and I've never been to a strip joint. Sometimes sexual addiction can involve illegal activity, prostitution, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, ex exhibitionism, child molestation, rape, and incest. Uh, so you need to be very careful about these things. Uh, by 2007, there were over 4 million pornographic sites on the Internet. 40 million Americans visit these sites regularly. 40 million. 70% of the visits are during work hours, so they're using their work computers to uh, uh, view their pornography. 10% of the people surfing uh, the porno sites are addicted uh, to online pornography and spend up to eight hours a day viewing sexual material. Worldwide, the pornography industry clears $57 billion a year. Oh, is that all? In the United States, the pornographic industry clears $12 billion a year. Much of the pornography is filmed and photographed in San Fernando Valley outside of Los Angeles. That's where my son used to live. Our neighbor, 
was a producer of pornographic, his neighbor was a, a producer of pornographic films. It was a young lady, she was in her 20s, and she was a producer of pornographic films, as bizarre as that sounds. Really nice lady until you found out what she did, as weird as that is. Um, in 2003, I went to South America, went to South America for six weeks. While I was gone, somebody used my computer at work to view all these pornographic sites. So when I came back, my, my computer was gone. My desk computer was gone. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I said, I, I went to my uh, boss and I said, where's my computer? She said, we found out, we found all these pornographic sites on it. Somebody had been visiting these pornographic sites. And of course, everybody's thinking, what did you do before you left? You know, one of, it was one of those kind of deals. I was gone. I was gone all summer. Come on, you guys. It couldn't possibly have been me. Uh, and they discovered who it was. it was. They were gay porno sites, too. It wasn't like it was fun stuff. Or I guess it was fun for them. But anyway, I, I almost got in trouble for, I don't know, <laughs> having a computer, I guess. That's about it. Three, three to six percent of the U.S. population are sex addicts. Uh, Eighty percent of the sex addicts are male. Uh, sexual addiction usually starts in the teen years and then peaks between the ages of 20 and 40, after which it slowly declines. Oh, it's fine. Uh, sexual addicts uh, seem to suffer uh, from other addictions in conjunction with their sexual problems. The DSM-4-TR identifies several paraphilias, exhibitionism, fetishism, furniturism, uh, pedophilia, sexual masochism, sexual sadism, transvestic fetishism, and voyeurism. So there's a ton of them. Uh, all of these things are really kind of strange. Real serious problem in uh, Japan, furniturism. Furniturism has to do with touching people inappropriately. Uh, what will happen is, I don't know if you've never been to Japan. Well, Ashley's been to Japan. But it's really crowded there. And so if you get on the subway, you've got people everywhere right there. And they're pushed right up against you. Uh, some of these old guys try to get close. To, and I say old, they're in the court. Uh, these businessmen, they try to get close to girl, uh, young girls in uh, um, uh, uniforms, in school uniforms. And they'll, they'll grab them and fondle them and whatnot. And of course, because of the culture in Japan, uh, people don't say anything about it. And of course, this became a, quite a, a problem. Um, and they're, they're trying to deal with it. I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do but uh, it's a real serious problem. Anyway, see you guys next week. Next week's the last week.